What's up, everybody? Matt Kajewski here, back again with the team at Osmo. And today, we are going to give you a first look at the college football national championship for DFS. We'll have content on this throughout the week, a live before lock eventually, other slate breakdowns, prize picks, everything you need. So this will just be a first look. But before we get started, make sure to hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you know when this and all other content goes live. But giving you a look at some of our data behind the scenes for this, again, this is a rematch of the SEC championship, but a few things to focus on here. We have a three-point spread in favor of Georgia, a 52.5-point total. Of course, we know Alabama took down the first matchup here, but two teams with clashing styles. Alabama plays extremely fast, 77 plays per game, with just shy of a 52% pass rate. Georgia much slower, much run heavier, 64.2 plays per game, a 42.5% pass rate. But we know Georgia will severely increase their plays per game and their pass rate when games are competitive. Their OC's Todd Go Todd Monken. He's known for his air raid concepts. They just weren't tested as much as Alabama all year, so they could play with leads and play with a run-heavy game script. But first thing here, we'll talk about the game a little bit overall, what we saw in the first contest, and then we'll get into DFS. First thing, it was kind of a routing by Alabama, but... A couple things I want to point out that people might not see just from looking at the box scores. The game was a little closer than I think people gave it credit for, especially at first glance. It was close, tied in halftime, and then coming out of the gate, Alabama really swept the second half, and there was a pick six by Stetson Bennett. Obviously, that didn't help, but Georgia moved the ball. Stetson had a very good game in that contest as well, but overall, this game, I think, could be decided by which quarterback can play a little bit under pressure. So in that first game, we had Stetson complete just one of 10 of his passes when he was pressured. He only had 11 yards. He threw an interception, obviously the interception that was returned for a touchdown. But that's not going to get it done. When you look at how Bryce Young performed when pressured, we, we know both these teams have good pass rushes, so that's why I bring this up. Bryce Young... When he was under pressure, he only completed six, or excuse me, five of 16 passes, but still 95 yards there, no turnovers. And that's what you need from a quarterback when you're under pressure. So Stetson, he was just a little bit less composed. Of course, it was probably the biggest stage of his career. But overall, it was still positive to see Stetson move the ball against the Alabama defense. I think both these teams could have success, pointing to maybe this going above the total, which is definitely what well, definitely what we saw in the first game where this hit 65. But Getting into the DFS side of things, we know Bryce Young is going to have no trouble moving the ball against Georgia's defense. He threw for 421 yards and three scores in the first game. This is a guy that averages 321 pass yards per game. He's doing so on elevated volume, 35 attempts per game, which is fantastic. Again, they're very fast, very passive. -y. And recently, we've seen him use his legs a little bit more. He was recruited as a dual threat, but he hasn't used his legs really at all this year. He was actually negative in rushing yards until the last two games of the year. And now we've seen him scramble a little bit more. He has 52 positive yards over the last two games. So seeing him use his mobility a little bit is very nice. And here you just benefit from elevated pass rate. He's the most expensive player on the slate, but I think for good reason. You're very live to use him in the captain slot. You're just going to have to make some concessions elsewhere. The con target concentration is pretty condensed here. So there is a chance that he throws you know, two touchdowns to a guy like Jamison Williams. That could be all that is enough for Jamison Williams to outscore Bryce Young. So I'm definitely going to use some of him in the captain, but probably leaning towards the flex. And in the run game, Brian Robinson, he's going to handle an enormous workload. In the first contest, 16 carries for him, six for Trey Sanders. They aired the ball out a little bit more instead of running against that elite Georgia up front unit. And I think that makes some sense here. But luckily, Robinson's involved in the past game. He had two targets in that contest as well. We've seen him just very involved as a pass catcher down the stretch here as well. So now no qualms with any of the people that are going to be targeting Brian Robinson here. He's an excellent play, averaging just shy of 100 yards per game. And Roy Dell Williams and Jason McClellan are still hurt, so they literally do not have alternatives to turn to. In the pass game, this is where you might see a player outscore a Bryce Young. Of course, Robinson could do it with touchdowns, but Jamison Williams, without John Mechie, is looking at an enormous target share. And only nine targets last week against Cincinnati. Again, that game was over before it even started. So Jamison Williams did not receive the volume that we would see in a competitive spot. He already has nearly 1,500 yards receiving this year on 111 targets. That is a 23.5% target share. Again, Mechie is vacating 
128 targets and another 1,142 yards himself. So that's very important for Jamison Williams. Interestingly, they continued to use Slade Bolden as a gadget player. He was only on the field about 50% of the snaps, and he only saw three targets. He did not see a substantial increase in his role, which I found very interesting. I thought Slade Bolden was going to be the clear wide receiver too, but that just was not the case. And instead, they moved to Ja'Cory Brooks, who was on the field nearly every single play. And Brooks actually had pretty decent volume too. Five targets in a game where they didn't actually have to air the ball out too much. So Brooks, at a very cheap price, 9600 here on DraftKings, he's probably a little too cheap for the role we're going to see. They didn't get this wrong, though. Bolden is still cheaper than Brooks, so take that off for what it's worth. But overall, Brooks, I still think, is a fantastic play. Then you saw a lot of 12 personnel from Bama, kind of like what we expected. They've done this situationally all year, but now without Mechie, this was something that was fairly predictable. You saw a lot of Jaleel Billingsley, about a 65% route rate. He's the more athletic receiving tight end, so that makes sense. But Cameron Latou still on the field about 45% of the time, 45% route rate for him. The targets between the two, Billingsley 2, Latou 1. And we know Billingsley's out-targeted Latou 7, 2-2 two, two in the last two games. But overall, this is a spot where either of these guys could score. They're big red zone weapons, but Billingsley's slightly more involved at a cheaper price. He's the one to look to, I think, if you're just punting at the tight end position. And then from there, it's showdown. It's the national championship. We have enormous contest. So for those of you that are looking in the depths, who is going to be playing for this team if, you know, there's a blowout, who's the guy that might be on the field for a long touchdown on a couple snaps, stuff like that. Overall, there's only a few players I really think that are in play for Alabama. You could look to a Gia Hall. He played five snaps. You could look to Thou Jones-Bell. He played three snaps. You could look to Treshawn Holden, who played five snaps. I mean, we're throwing a lot of darts here. You're probably also taking a look at JoJo Early. He actually played on 18 snaps, had 10 routes. Early did not play a significant role outside of just the one target he saw, but he's on the field a decent amount. And we did see a 30% route rate in his return from injury. That's at least significant enough. The only other guy to mention, Javon Baker, he was on the field for a 15% route rate. If I'm ranking these players outside of the receiving options, it's Billingsley 1, Latou 2, JoJo Early 3, and Javon Baker 4. Getting to the Georgia side. Again, we have Stetson, who had a very good year, struggled a little bit in the, in the SEC championship, rebounded very nicely against Michigan. He's a guy who's quite mobile, 283 yards on the ground this year. Somewhat limited as a passer, 203 yards per game on 20 attempts. That speaks more to Georgia taking their foot off the gas and the fact that he wasn't a full-time starter to begin the year. That was JT Daniels before injury took him out. But Betson, Stetson Bennett, excuse me, he did play very well in the SEC championship outside of some of the turnovers and under pressure. He still passed for 340 yards, the two interceptions, but still had a pretty good passer rating, good completion percentage in yards per attempt. So if he can avoid some of the pressure and the mistakes, I think Betson still Stetson Bennett is still live here. And he's mobile, which gives him a floor that Bryce Young doesn't have or a ceiling Bryce Young doesn't have. I don't really want to say floor with Bryce Young because he throws the ball so much. But Benson, Stetson Bennett, interesting captain position here for the favorite. In the run game, it's still a pretty nasty timeshare. And the return of Kendall Milton kind of rendered this a four-man committee once again. It's going to be Zamir White, the favorite for carries. He had 12. He actually outcarried James Cook 12 to 6 after Cook had outcarried him in the SEC championship. But we know Zamir White is basically a non factor in the past game. He has nine targets on the year. You're going to have to get there with a touchdown with Zamir, and he's priced appropriately for that reason. James Cook is more of a pass catching back, but just six carries. And interestingly, James Cook has started to seed a lot of pass game work to Kenny McIntosh. Kenny McIntosh wasn't a huge point in the run game, and he hasn't been, even with Milton out. But McIntosh, he's had at least two targets and in at least four game in the last four games for Georgia. And he's had at least three in three of the last four. So McIntosh is on the field, and a lot of it comes on pass downs. But ultimately, James Cook is still the top back for this team because of the pass catching role he plays. We saw him lined up as a receiver against Michigan and catch a go route touchdown in that game. So James Cook, just dynamic. I think if you're playing a back, it's him. Kendall Milton is kind of the guy who's a little bit of an unknown. Coming off a knee sprain in the game against Michigan, he handled seven carries. Only five carries behind Zamir White. 
He also doesn't really have a pass catching role, but this is a guy who is very clearly their number three back before injury. Again, this guy missed four games and he still has 56 carries, which ties Kenny McIntosh. So Milton is a very cheap punt play for Georgia in the run game. Pass game. It is the Brock Bauer show for Georgia. In the last contest against Alabama, he had 15 targets. Again, they weren't really pushed too much by Michigan, so just five targets there. But Bowers, he easily leads the team in receiving 846 yards. He very well could be your optimal captain if he catches the receiving touchdown and Georgia's able to hold Bama. From there, the wide receiver two and three were Donai Mitchell and Jermaine Burton. Both of them played about 55% of the snaps, 55% of the routes. We saw two targets for Burton, three targets for Donai Mitchell. Lad McConkey actually had four targets. He was tied for second on the team behind Bowers, but McConkey was only on the field for about 30% of the routes. So you can see there is a floor with McConkey that's just a little bit riskier than Adonai Mitchell and Jermaine Burton. And McConkey, he's priced a little bit higher than Adonai Mitchell, which I would rather just pay down for Mitchell. But Jermaine Burton, he got the price jump. Outside of that, you saw a bunch of receivers on and off the field. Darnell Washington played a lot as a second tight end, mostly as a blocker. You know, he's a big athletic former five star, but Darnell Washington still saw a target. So he's on the field. We need to consider him. And unlike Alabama, Georgia is just going to rotate a lot more pass catchers onto the field. So Washington's one. John Fitzpatrick is the third tight end. They use a ton of 12 personnel. So you'll see them both. Neither are particularly strong plays, but Washington, 47% route rate. Fitzpatrick was at 41%. From there, Outside of Jermaine Burton and Adonai Mitchell, again, McConkey 32% route rate, but then you had Kiaris Jackson at 38%. You had George Pickens at 24%. You have players mixing onto the field like Dominic Blaylock, like Marcus Rosemey Jack Saint. There's just a lot more bodies here. So far, as far as priority, Adonai Mitchell is the most mispriced outside of Bowers. So he's a preference for me, but then I think you're really looking at Jermaine Burton, Lad McConkey, and George Pickens. George Pickens is just such an unknown coming off the ACL tear in the spring game. He's their one wide receiver one when healthy, but playing 25% of the snaps right now. Again, that could be a function of just getting up early against Michigan, or it could be a function of he's just not ready for a full complement of snaps. So Pickens is a fantastic GPP play. But that will do it for the slate breakdown. The first look, again, we'll be back later in the week. So make sure to catch that. We'll have live before lock everything you need for the national championship showdown slate. I am Matt Gajewski on Twitter at Matt underscore Gajewski. Thank you guys for watching and we'll catch you again next time.